Our next participant is Truth in Accounting, so we'll let Sheila come up and get settled in and uh, introduce herself. Good morning. Good morning. And thank you for your efforts to bring transparency and accountability <laughs> to state and local governments. I do have a cheering crowd. I was going to say, it sounds like you got a cheering it's, crowd out there. It's a very <laughs> impressive. Um, they wouldn't fit in the room. I had so many admirers, but they're, they're in a subsidiary room watching. Um, at Truth in Accounting, we believe our representative forms of governments are at risk because citizens do not have the information needed to be knowledgeable participants in their governments. <clears throat> Decisions on tax and spending policies and even who to vote for are skewed by opaque, opaque and misleading information. Providing citizens and legislators with information about the government's budgeted funds, we will call governmental funds in my comments budgeted funds because that's what a lot of them are, is essential because the budget process is each government's largest financial decision-making process. One of Gatsby's major, major assertions behind the proposed use of short-term accounting perspective for budgeted funds is that financial statements would convey fiscal accountability. Fiscal accountability was first mentioned during deliberations of Gatsby 34. As you can see from my first handout, fiscal accountability and operational accountability are discussed in paragraph 203 of GASB 34 with a footnote citing the American Accounting Association report of the Committee of Concepts of Accounting Applicable to Public Sector, page 81. I have provided you with an excerpt of that page. It reads, also, except where legislative permission is given to otherwise, all receipts collected by any government agency, any agency of the government, are required to be remitted to the general treasury. Moreover, authority to draw on the treasury may also be subject to additional legislative authority. Thus, responsible officials are accountable for all monies flowing into and out of their custody, and proper accounting will disclose such inflows. I believe that the, short the statement of changes in short-term uh, uh, financial resource inflows uh, will help the responsible officials meet the need to be accountable for all monies flowing into and out of their custody but the fiscal accountability definition is much broader. If you lift, you'll have to tear it off. If you lift the um, black portion of the document, you will, you will find the full discussion of fiscal accountability. It reads, by far the, most, the dominant concept of accountability as practiced in government today is fiscal accountability. At every level of government, rules and policies are established to ensure dollar honesty and integrity in fiscal affairs. No funds can be spent except in consequence of legal authority. Moreover, no government administrator can enter into an agreement, place an order, or otherwise commit the government to a payment of funds without legislative authority to do so. Consequently, the accounting system is charged with keeping record of all legal authorities as well as all commitments, agreements, encumbrances, obligations, and expenditures that are used that use any portion of the authorities granted. The third paragraph states, fiscal accountability is essential through a periodic reporting of account balances and other financial information to appropriate authorities. These reports may disclose the status of the funds, amounts collected, amounts obligated or expended, the status of expendable assets and claims against those assets and other such information. In cases where revenues are earned as a result of certain activities, financial reports may also include 
income and expense statements, as well as a formal balance sheet containing both expendable and non-expendable assets, as well as long-term debt. This broader definition highlights other information the users need to know about the budgeted funds, such as long-term debt, including all legal authority, as well as all commitments and obligations. As mentioned, users of the budgeted fund statements need periodic reporting of the status of the funds, amounts obligated, and the claims against those assets. Therefore, the users of the budgeted fund statements need to know all of the claims against the assets of budgeted funds, including the commitments and obligations the budgeted funds will ultimately pay. Notice the last paragraph uses the term expenses instead of expenditures and long-term debt is mentioned. Users of the budgeted statements need information about the short-term and long-term consequences of budget decisions at the fund level. While the long-term consequences are reported on the government-wide statements, unfortunately, governments do not budget on a government-wide basis. They budget on a fund basis. Therefore, the broader definition of fiscal accountability should be in incorporated in the accounting for budgeted fund statements. That is why we strongly advocate, are advocating for full accrual balance sheet and statements of activities at the fund level. We have found numerous instances where elected, elected officials and even government financial officers point to general fund balances reported as evidence of their government's financial health. I have provided you with a article about the Chicago Public Schools that was published on January 29, 2019. The headline says, CPS finishes year with, um, with surplus as CTU talks go on. The second paragraph starts, the district ended the 2018 fiscal year with a $324 million left over in CPS's general operating fund for the first time in three years. That fund has concluded in the red. I am certain that if, if that the general fund has money left over, it is because the government did not adequately fund the pensions and OPEB benefits the employees earned and the government incurred during the year. Under the proposed financial reporting model, the general fund most likely in the audited financial statements would also show a positive general fund balance. Users of the general fund statements would not be able to tell the pension and OPEB liabilities that were not adequately funded. Users would not be able to see that the amount of pe pensions and OPEB debt that would have to be paid out of the general fund. Truth in Accounting's latest analysis of CPS indicates that CPS has $12.4 billion of unfunded pension debt and $2.2 billion of unfunded OPEB debt that will not be reported on the general fund's balance sheet. One could argue that the users of the budgeted funds would have to be educated that the statements are calculated on a short-term basis. But under the proposed financial reporting model, the only general fund balance calculated will be the one under the short-term perspective. Therefore, this general fund balance will be the one governmental officials will point to as an indication of the financial condition of that fund and their government, and that they balance their budget. The users of the financial report need a general fund balance calculated using a long-term perspective. To obtain the government's overall financial condition, a user should look at the government's wide statements, but as I mentioned, unfortunately, governments do not budget on the government-wide basis. They budget on the fund basis. For the budgeted financial statements to provide useful information 
Full accrual balance sheets and in statements of activities need to be prepared. These statements would provide the following useful decision information for decision making. The amount of costs being pushed on to future taxpayers as a result of decisions made during the budget process. Oh, I, should, I should stop each time they clap. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I, didn't know that, I didn't know that comment deserved a clap. <laughs> the amount of general fund assets that will be needed to fund the unfunded pension and OPEB debt. The general fund balance including assets and long-term debt that will be paid with the general fund assets. While the statement of short-term financial resources flows will be useful, I urge you to require full accrual budgeted fund statements so that they will convey the information needed to assess fiscal accountability as originally defined. Thank you for your time and your efforts. Thank you, Sheila. Appreciate it. We'll go ahead and turn to board and staff questions, and I'll start with Michael. Well, one can hypothesize that the reason uh, governments and, and users don't make much use of the government-wide statements is that it includes uh, infrastructure assets, which overwhelms er everything else. Um, unfortunately, if you're going to go to a full accrual basis, you can't uh, just include the liabilities. You've got to include the assets as well. So it seems to me on a full accrual basis, you now have to include all of the infrastructure assets, mm -hmm. uh, which would be valued at historical cost and less depreciation, a, a figure which seems to me is totally useless for most decisions. Therefore, the fund balance would be equally useful, useless. Wouldn't that result, therefore, in governments ignoring those fund statements for budgeting purposes, just as they ignore the government-wide statements for uh, budgeting purposes? Thank you for your comment. Uh, what we would foresee as with the government-wide statements, an unrestricted asset number would be calculated under this model, and the model we're proposing. And that is, we, we, we call that the magic number, um, unrestricted assets. It represents the amount of, if it's a negative balance, the amount of prior costs that are being pushed on to future taxpayers. So while the assets would be there, there would be a general fund balance with those there would also be that unrestricted asset amount um, that would be very valuable in knowing how much prior costs would be pushed on to future uh, taxpayers. So in other words, there would be, in effect, a short-term fund balance as well. Is that right? And that would be the, un the unrestricted amount would essentially be a, a shorter-term balance or not? Again, it would. What we would envision is... Um, that when you add up all the fund statements and you do some eliminating entries, they would equal, those accumulations would equal um, the government-wide statement. Um, at, so they would mirror those statements. And, and I do agree with your, um, I do agree with you mentioned that, um, you know, what, what well, I'm a CPA myself, an AICPA member. What role do CPAs um, play in this and play in government's financial um, situation? And um, my team is actually upset that I have not written a book called Complicit, Complacent, or Conspiracy, and they would fall um, into uh, that uh, one of those realms. But I would be interested in exploring the model that you propose a little bit further. Yeah. Jim. Thank you for being here. Appreciate your input. Um, in your comments, uh, you advocate for the uh, fund financial statements to be on uh, full accrual economic resources mm -hmm. measurement focus. In other words, the basis of accounting that's used and uh, the measurement focus that's currently used in the government wide. Uh, you also talk about uh, the uh, comparability to budget to a certain extent. Uh, I want to ask a two-part question. The first one is, do you have any information, uh, either anecdotally or from the research that you've done, as to um, how many uh, governments as a percentage of the total governments, and I'm talking about general purpose governments, that, uh, like cities, counties, et cetera, that budget uh, in accordance with generally accepted accounting principles? 
Um, as far as I know, uh, New York City, and they tout a lot that their uh, budget is done according to generally accepted accounting principles. Um, and believe it or not, Illinois um, is calculates their budget in concert by law is supposed to calculate their budget in concert with generally accepted accounting principles. Um, so New York City, um, when we did our 75 state uh, cities, uh, most populated city study, they come out as the worst uh, city. Um, but they do their budget according to generally accepted accounting principles and tout that. Um, but obviously, but what they what they do is they use the government why uh, the governmental funds accounting the modified accrual basis to calculate it. Um, and Illinois um, also, uh, when we highlighted to Illinois initially that um, when we looked at their budget, we found that law. It was called the Truth in Budgeting Law that required them to report the um, statements in concert with generally accepted. In accounting principles, we're like, well, hold it. They're not do using generally accepted accounting principles. They're not including the pension, retiree, health care um, expenses in the budget process. They're only concluding what was um, funded. The comptroller's office came back to us and said, well, even though the drafters, the initial drafters at that bill had, suggest had debated that corporate generally accepted accounting principles should be used at the last minute for government, was put in, so generally accepted accounting principles for government was put in. Um, and then number two, that the bill, the legislation lists individual funds. So therefore, they said, therefore we can use the fund accounting, which is modified accrual accounting. And um, again, you know, that accounting has um, led, you know, Illinois and New York City into horrible financial shape. Well, second part of my question is going to uh, build on your answer to the first part, mm -hmm. uh, which uh, I think you're saying there are pockets where there might be budgeting in terms of generally accepted mm -hmm. accounting principles, mm -hmm. but at least nationwide, uh, the uh, bases on which budgets are prepared uh, are certainly not uh, universally generally accepted accounting principles, and they tend to vary quite a bit from jurisdiction, jurisdiction, state to state, and so on being statutorily dependent. So my uh, question is, uh, we have a input from a number of commenters who indicate that uh, one of the major uh, concerns they have is keeping the fund financial reporting as close to the budget, the way they budget as possible. And uh, saying in some instances they think that um, enhances uh, financial accountability and in other instances that uh, it gives a truer depiction of uh, the fund balance that's available for expenditure in future periods. And I just wondered uh, what your, uh, because you're advocating differently than what they seem to be advocating, um, what's your reaction uh, as to how the board should try to reconcile those two uh, perspectives? Uh, we believe that um, budgets are calculated what we call political math. And to try to mirror that political math is asinine. Um, and, you know, e yes, um, they would both agree with each other, um, but they would both be wrong. Um, and Illinois, um, New York City, other governments, um, you know, prove that um, I, I think we have uh, 49 out of the, not 49, um, I think it's 39 of the 50 states um, need money to pay their bills. And I think that those poor budgeting practices then that are mirrored in the, um, in the accounting um, is, is, part of, is part of the reason, is the reason for that, is because they have been able to take these costs and push them on to future taxpayers and they have, um, um, n and the financial statements have not pointed that out. Um, and, and financial statements shouldn't mirror the wrong accounting, they should mirror reality. David? Oh, and I'm sorry, I'm sorry, David. And you know, one of the, their rationale is for, again, for fiscal accountability, 
and as defined in the ITC, fiscal accountability was looking at the short-term perspective. And as I noted in my original, in my oral testimony here, that is not what a fiscal accountability means. That term was hijacked to justify the use of short-term um, accounting. Thank you. First of all, Sheila, thank you for being here today. We, uh, we very much appreciate the fact that you're advocating on behalf of citizens and uh, we rarely hear from citizens and it's, uh, so it's, it's uh, good to hear from a citizen's perspective. The points that you make about the Chicago public school system, you know, I, we certainly understand those points. When you talk about the state of Illinois, you mentioned that they infer that they're on a gap-based budget, but yet when you look at their financial statements in the general fund, they're showing a $16 billion deficit. Mm -hmm. So obviously it's not on a gap basis. I mean, this is, this is looking at their financial statements, $16 billion general fund deficit mm -hmm. on, a gap, on a gap basis currently. They have $134 billion of unfunded pensions and right, exactly. $54 no. billion dollars of OPEB. But, but the legislature hasn't responded to a $16 billion deficit, something that some people would say, well, there's some hope there. If, if it became a $150 billion, do you think there would be a different reaction? Um, I think there has been a different reaction. Uh, people in Illinois are concerned about the pensions now. In the past, they have not been concerned about the pensions, mm -hmm. and people are understanding the gravity of those. Um, you know, I think it's us and others pointing out the not the general fund balance, but the overall government-wide balance right. um, is part of, of the reason for people starting to care about that. And as the legislature was making those decisions to incur those costs, if those costs would have been recorded on the general fund income statement, would, um, I believe, decisions, um, at least people would have known what was happening. Um, instead, the government was able to come out, say we have a balanced budget, um, and there were you know, little evidence um, that there, you know, the ordinary citizen couldn't go, oh, well, you're really not balancing your budget. Yeah. But they, they didn't have a balanced budget on a gap basis at any time, or at least my experience with Illinois over the last 40 years, they haven't had a balanced gap mm -hmm. budget. And I think, you know, Illinois, I think, is a unique situation like that. Um, mm -hmm. there, but there are other governments throughout the country. Um, you know, our research of, um, I think, when I testified on the ITC, we talked mm -hmm. about local governments here in Illinois having a positive general fund balance and indicating that, yes, we do have extra cash that we could spend and didn't even look at um, their, uh, their um, government-wide you know, uh, um, unfunded pension and retiree health care that would go against that. We also found evidence that I did not bring um, in MDNA where governments are talking in, in the long term, I think it was Arlington Heights, in their long term um, financial planning section in MDNA, they talk about the general fund positive balance. Um, and so this is pointed to by a lot of government officials as a positive thing without looking at their overall financial condition. I equivocate it when I, you know, talk to, you know, the ordinary <coughs> citizens. I say, this is like me pointing to my checking account that, you know, I have a thousand dollars in my checking account without highlighting that, oh, look at, you know, here's my, here's my credit card debt. Um, just, you know, ignore that. But I do have $1,000 in my credit card in my bank statement. Okay. Thank you. Brian. Well, Sheila, no, I actually have a couple of questions, but I'm going to ask one now and see if there's time left, and I'll circle back later and see if I can get the second one in. Um, with respect to having the fund statements take a, Long, governmental fund statements take a longer term perspective. Can you um, comment on how we might deal with the allocation problem? In other words, allocating capital assets and long term debt, particularly when we're looking, we need to probably look backward retrospectively. And 
Can you talk about the cost benefit that might be involved there and also the impact on small governments? It's kind of a multi-part. Yeah, um, you know, this is a, governments have done their budgeting the way they've done their budgeting for years. And we know that this is a totally new concept for governments, um, but we think it is a concept that does need to happen. Um, they were able to um, do this um, similar things in New Zealand and Australia um, at the federal level. Um, and um, yes, it would be difficult, but I do remember testifying before this board about um, allocating unfunded pension liabilities um, and that you know, people felt that that was going to be very difficult to do. Um, and I did point out that, you know, we do have a computers now um, and that there would, you know, it wouldn't be um, simple at first, um, but, you know, I have confidence that it could happen. And, you know, smaller governments um, may need more guidance, um, but, um, you know, I, I think it's just a change in mindset. Thank you. If I could just follow up on that. Sheila, as you know, in, in New Zealand and Australia, they eliminated fund statements. Mm -hmm. it, they, they only have government-wide. Do you think that's an appropriate approach then, to take the approach that they have? Um, I am not sure. Um, so I, I go back and forth. I'm just like, one, one, one huge problem that I've had with the fund statements is the voluminousness in the financial report. And previously, when the pension liability was shown in the schedule of funding progress with all those statements you were like you know digging into page 200 um, before you got to the real you know to that liability and now you're digging through those fund statements before you you know so I've I've, de I've debated never come up with an infinitive answer you know some days I'm like throw them out completely <laughs> um, some days I might go put them in RSI um, some days I might put them in a separate schedule um, so I, I've really honestly never um, you know, come up with a definite, um, I, I think that if you're going to keep them on a short-term basis, um, throw them out. <laughs> um, okay. Put them in a, a separate uh, document or put them in RSI, but don't have them so close up to the, uh, to the beginning of the statements. Okay. Thank you. Chris. Good morning. Good morning, Chris. So just a quick question for you. Um, what would you say to the argument, there's, you know, when, when you look at the financial statements, um, Really, the objective is to view them as a whole, as one you know, cohesive unit. So you're looking at the notes, you're looking at the government-wide and the fund financial statements, and they all provide um, somewhat of a different perspective, some more detailed, um, you know, one, that full accrual approach, and then the other one with the, you know, the current resources. So what would you say to the argument that the, that the information is in the financial statements just um, you, you have to view it collectively. You can't go to one statement and expect to get the whole truth. The whole truth lies throughout the financial statements, and then that's what um, legislature, legislators or you know, whoever um, the, the citizens will hold accountable uh, should be responsible for reviewing when setting the budget. Um, I would say that the governments do not budget on the government-wide basis, um, and so therefore, they, you know, look at those general fund statements um, as evidence of, you know, how much general fund that can, you know, they balance they have, um, and so, you know, unfortunately, I look at them as a total, but they don't budget on a government-wide basis where those full those accruing expenses would show up. Um, I was speaking to a reporter just yesterday, and he was astounded that the proposed financial, re under the pr current and proposed financial reporting model, the um, net pension liability shows up in none of the funds statements. He's like, how could that even be possible? But you know, it shows it up has to come, I said it comes at the government wide basis, but but then it almost like, you know, and I, am, I think I almost writ wrote this, but didn't, it, it's, it's almost like they magically appear on the government wide statement. It's like, well, yeah, but where, where were these generated? You know, none of the fund statements have them in there. Um, you know, what 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 fund um, created these? What budget decision uh, created these? Um, you know, where where did these these net pension liabilities mysteriously appear from? They're just all of a sudden on the government wide statement. Thank you. So the analogy 
to um, your earlier example, um, just the, the question would be, is it better to show that your, your monthly expenses um, are a deficit on one statement because you have $1,000 in cash, but you have $16,000 in credit card debt that you're negative 15 for the month, or is it really two, it could be two statements if be. you have your two statements that represent your financial statements showing that you're 16,000 in debt, but if you take a current view, you have 1,000 available and currently. We, yes, and we, thank you. We believe that, you know, the short-term, um, what do you call it, financial resources flow statement is a valuable statement. And we're not saying do not prepare that statement. We're saying go ahead and provide users with both perspective. The short-term perspective, they need that. Uh, they need to know how much cash they have available in the current coming year, but also provide the long-term perspective in the full accrual statement of, uh, of um, balance sheet and uh, statement of activities. Thank you. Okay, well, regretfully we're out of time, but Sheila, thank you so much for coming to share your thoughts and perspectives. We truly appreciate you taking the time. Thank, thank you so you. much. Our next participant is Dan Proft, who's a private citizen. So Dan, if you want to come to the table, introduce yourself. Uh, we'll give you about 10 minutes to make your comments that you would like to make, and then we'll open it to board and staff questions. So welcome. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Uh, as you mentioned, I'm a private citizen. I'm on the board of Truth and Accounting. Uh, I have some background in municipal government. I was a city manager for I saw suburban community for a time, worked in municipal and state government. So what i have uh, about to say has, um, uh, it's not reflective of any antagonism towards government, um, but you know, I've worked in government and I'm a wonderful guy, so there's nothing <laughs> that's antagonistic towards people who work in government. But there is something that's problematic. In truth and accounting, we're interested in fact-based budgeting. And, uh, it's not fact-based budgeting when you budget only looking at the balance in your checking account and not the balance on your credit card. And that's what we've been doing in Illinois at the municipal level and the state level as long as I've been an adult in this state. And it's why Illinois has the largest, in part, the phony baloney accounting is why people don't appreciate the peril Illinois faces with the largest unfunded pension and healthcare liabilities in the country. Uh, it's why there was the need for an intercept law, because municipalities were trying to play some of the same games that the state was, has been playing for low these many years to avoid obligations they're incurring in real time because they can't finance it. And all you have to do is ask Evanston or Harvey or North Chicago about the public safety officers and, and employees that they've had to lay off because of the rubber meeting the road when it comes to math. So my uh, perspective here, speaking as a layman, is just to suggest that anybody in a position to end the fraud that is being perpetrated on taxpayers and business owners in this state should do whatever they can in furtherance of that laudable goal. New York City and Illinois have laws that require the legislators to calculate its balanced budget using generally accepted accounting principles of government. And the fact is the state of Illinois hasn't had a truly balanced budget since before the White Sox won the World Series, no matter what the Constitution says. Because the budget is done at the fund level, these governments have used the modified accrued, uh, uh, modified accrued accounting standards used to prepare budgeted funds financial statements. This method is so flawed, New York City has accumulated $60 billion in unfunded pension benefits, $95 billion in unfunded retiree health care debt. Illinois has accumulated $134 billion in unfunded pension benefits and $52 billion in unfunded retiree health care costs, at least that's our calculation. If only the short-term perspective is used to prepare the budgeted fund statements, government officials will continue to uh, make claims of balancing their budgets according to generally accepted accounting principles while incurring billions of dollars of debt which will be passed on to future taxpayers. 
And I know you've heard from legislators, current and former, on this topic, including legislators who are also accounting professionals in their private lives, like former State Senator Steve Rauschenberger, like former State Representative Jeannie Ives. We know that they'll do this. I mean, you don't have to, you know, this isn't like a laboratory experiment. This story in the Sun-Times this year, CPS finishes, Chicago Public Schools finishes year with surplus as CTU, the teachers union, talks get going. CPS, and this is you know how people understand what's happening in government is through the media, right? CPS reported that in 2018, 2018 fiscal year, they uh, uh, wound up with three, $324 million left over in their general operating fund. So you read this story as a layman and you say, oh, well, CPS is running budget surpluses. But then you include a fully accrued accounting for CPS's budget, and you find that actually they ran an $800 billion deficit, $800 million deficit, excuse me. It's a billion dollar difference in what is being promoted versus what the reality is. And I understand this is a state where math is an opinion, but at uh, some point, I think there's gonna be some people that realize it's not. And the reason that the numbers are so important and that the work that you all do and the work that accounting professionals do is so important is because those numbers reflect real people's lives. Taxpayers' lives, pensioners' lives. And they're being misled. I mean, there's just no two ways about it. Governments like New York City and Illinois calculate their budgets using accounting gimmicks, like recording loan proceeds as revenues selling long-term assets and included pension costs based upon what legislation chose to pay in, what legislators chose to pay into the pension plans, not based on the benefits earned and the liability incurred during the budget period. To have a goal of aligning the financial reporting model for budgeted funds with the way governments calculate the budgets is frankly asinine. And by the way, there are accounting professionals who agree with me and the position of truth in accounting, including a former member of GASB, Marty Ives, who said that the meaning, or the distinction, I should say, between fiscal accountability and operational accountability was pure, unadulterated bull jive, he used a more colorful term, written in order to justify retention of modified accrual accounting in the funds. I understand the meaning of budgetary accountability and I've always felt that it was appropriate for the GASB to require preparation of a budgetary comparison statement as well as a statement comparing actual results on a budget basis with actual results on the accrual basis. And this is somebody who served on this body for 10 years. So I, I, I'm you know, a little bit stumped, frankly, I'm not assigning blame, I'm just sort of you know, talking openly about it, a little stumped as to what the confusion is. The rating agencies aren't confused. I mean, you're not fooling them. <laughs> the state is not fooling and these governments are not fooling rating agencies. Small businesses, the entrepreneurs, the job creators in the state, they are not confused. Uh, I bank at Signature Bank, which is a uh, a bank that's been around for about 15 years now in Chicago, Chicago a business bank, they're focused on businesses. They serve the small to mid-size owner-operator businesses throughout the region. And I asked the founders of that bank just the other day on my little radio program, what is it you hear from the clients you serve about the state of Illinois? What's the thing that concerns them most from a public policy perspective? And they said pensions, public sector pensions because they know the state isn't accounting for their liabilities and their local municipalities where they live, where they operate their business, so not accounting for their liabilities the way that they have to in operation of their business. By the way, the, ra the way that private sector unions have to account for the liabilities they accrue. Somehow, uh, government is exempt from the vagaries of math and accounting. I don't know why. Neither do they. And they're very concerned about that because they know the gathering, the storm is gathering and they know who is going to strike the hardest 
when it ultimately comes to pass. I mean, I guess my question to this board, a question that we all should be asking ourselves as private citizens, as accounting professionals, as business owners, is what are you going to say? What are you going to say to Chicago police officers and firefighters when those pension funds capsize? And they were told the beautiful lies this entire time, not a problem, we've got it. And essentially, because of the accounting gimmicks I referenced earlier, uh, we've had professionals in this space aiding and abetting the, the beautiful lies. Chicago police and pension funds are both less than 25% funded, as most of you probably know. They're death spiraling. And uh, there is not the seriousness to address these public policy problems in the political and policy arenas because there are just not enough people holding the policymakers' feet to the fire. And it's not simply the job of accounting and financial professionals, of course, there's only so much people can do. Um, but there are things that can be done from this sector to demand more accountability so that people understand what's happening, the size and scope of the problem to facilitate a sort of debate that produces solutions that measure up to the size and scope of these problems. That is not happening. So what are you gonna tell police officers and firefighters when those pension funds capsize and people get IOUs in the mail instead of checks, pension checks they relied on? They held up their end. Why isn't the state or their municipality, uh, the municipality that employed them, why do they get to not hold up their end? Beautiful lies or ugly truths? Beautiful lies have brought us to this point where we have to start telling some ugly truths and try to, I think, promulgate strictures that demand, incentivize as much as possible a leveling with people. That hasn't happened for many, many moons. And Booker T. Washington was fond of saying that uh, you can call right wrong and you can call evil good. It doesn't make it so just because the majority agrees. So I, I hope this body is less interested in trying to forge consensus driven by public sector professionals trying to propagate the beautiful lives and more focused on laying down some standards that apply in just about every other walk of life except government, particularly in this state, so that uh, we can get to a better place, frankly, a more honest place. You know, accounting professionals can live in these silos and uh, sort of do the innocent bystander routine that is very popular here, or they can be at the tip of the spear driving solutions based on the principles that are otherwise advanced, the standards that are otherwise set, and all of those other walks of life. Thank you very much. Thank you, I appreciate your comments, and we'll turn to board and staff questions, and I'll start with Michael. As one who's generally sympathetic with much of what you've said, let me suggest that accountants often get a bad rap. Welcome let me, to the club. Let me go back to many years ago when New York City was having its fiscal problems. I used to go on the subway every morning and the train would stop at 86th Street and all the investment bankers from uh, Upper East Side would get on. We'd then stop at Grand Central and the investment bankers from uh, from Westchester would get on. Then between 42nd Street and 14th Street, it would always get stuck every day, and it was hot as hell in the summertime. Now, what were these guys thinking? What were these investment bankers thinking? Didn't it occur to them that maybe the city was in financial trouble because they couldn't repair the subways? Or in Detroit, when it took an hour to get EMS out there, weren't these people thinking that maybe Detroit was, was in bad fiscal shape? Mm -hmm. So the point is that the information was there. Now, with respect to accounting, you know, the financial statements always revealed the, uh, the pension liability. It may not have been computed as, as well as it should have been, 
but basically it was there. In other words, all the information was there. Academic research indicates, with respect to the stock market, that if the information is there, it doesn't matter where it is. People know about it, and it doesn't affect the th They take it into account. So here's my question. Let's suppose that we did reveal this, the long-term information in the financial statements. Would it change any decisions, given that people already have this information? Yeah, yeah I, think, I think it would. And, and I go back to just this one example, but there are many more. This coverage in the Sun-Times of uh, CPS's budget surplus. Um, I think it would because you don't have to look for, oh, by the way, I mean, just in terms of since we're, you know, assigning blame and people get, uh, I mean, you know, journalists, not necessarily always um, the most dogged, not necessarily the uh, greatest self-starters. Self they are, you know, they are spoon-fed from agencies, units of government that had a particular interest in, in, in spinning a particular narrative. And sometimes they don't ask the secondary and tertiary questions they should ask, too. So, I mean, there's, uh, there's plenty of blame to go around, number one. And number two, I'm not suggesting that fact-based accounting is a panacea. And I'm not suggesting that everybody who's not paying attention now will suddenly pay attention. I'm not suggesting that at all. But I think you make it more difficult to engage in this ledger domain that you see on, in newspapers like the Sun-Times and Tribune and others, too. I think it's just a more complete and compelled reckoning with the financial reality for these units of government than you're otherwise getting with sort of the funds here and the general. And, and so why not, why not hold government to the same standards that uh, the private corporations are held to, why not make this uh, more comprehensive, linear, transparent? I mean, it, there's only upside, I guess was my point, even though I recognize that uh, political leaders and policymakers can be willfully blind no matter how comprehensive and transparent the reporting is. David Bean. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And thank you for uh, taking the time to testify today. Um, a couple times you've mentioned holding governments accountable to the same level as the private sector. As, as you all know, in the private sector, they only have entity-wide financial statements. They don't have detailed fund financial statements. Right. And at the entity-wide level, the pension liabilities there, the OPEB liabilities there, all the, all the concerns that you're talking about are in our government-wide financial statements. And I guess the question is, is that's the, the basically same type of information you would see in the, in the private sector. Why aren't people focusing in on that information from your perspective? Well, I mean, I, 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 again, I think um, you're allowed to present half the, well, you're allowed, because of the bifurcation, you have governments that present half the picture. And so, uh, were that to change, then it would provide a greater demand to present the whole picture. I mean, what, I, I guess I, I would put this back on you, too, if I'm allowed to no. query you. I mean, why, why not do that? I mean, what, what, is, the, what is the utility of those uh, uh, separate pictures? Well, the, I mean, the, the idea behind it is, to, you know, you have a long-term review of the government and you have a short-term. You, know, you had mentioned the, um, the rating agencies, and uh, one of the famous quotes out of the rating agencies, without the short-term, there is no long-term. Um, so there's a, a focus on the short-term, and then there's a focus on the long-term, and, and the government-wide statements are intended, like the private sector, consolidated statements without divvying up between funds but that's a, a view of the long-term nature of the government. Yeah, but the short-term position isn't contemplating uh, liabilities you're incurring in real time, and so that's, that's the fundamental problem, it seems to me, right? So you're giving me a short-term cash position. It'd be like me saying, you know, the balance in my checkbook is $1,000, but I'm not telling you about the $1,000 I just put on my credit card coming home today, I'm running errands. Well, that's not, so my short-term position is not an honest short-term position because I got 30 days to pay my credit card bill. Mm 
mm -hmm. or finance it as you know we're want to do here um, and so 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 that's why so it, the short the the siloed short term position presents a stilted view of even the short term position much long much uh, much less the long term stability or financial outlook Brian Just to, just to respond to one point and then a question. I would, I would assert that we are in pursuit of fact-based budgeting here. I think that the, the issue is, is how to best present those facts and to, and to do it in a way that uh, is something that our stakeholders, stakeholders can manage. Um, but when you talked about this, you know, these two sets of financial statements, I think we have to say first that we don't make standards for budgeting. So the states and whatnot, they have all their own rules on how they do this. Uh, we do have a provision to have those numbers pre uh, presented in the financial statements, but we don't control really how, what they, they look like. Um, so when we have these two sets of financial statements, a bit of a corollary when uh, Dave Bean mentioned, mentioned earlier, we do have the longer term view and the shorter term view. Would it be your um, opinion that there's really no need for that shorter term view? Uh, I, the shorter, uh, I want the the fund basis. The government. Yes, no, I understand, but I, I want the 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 complete short term view. So the complete short term view, as I just used with my little you know credit card, and uh, checking account balance metaphor. I mean, I, I you know the, the the whole kind of one thing you said too about your stakeholders. I mean, look, you know we're. Um, uh, I don't know if we're all Illinois residents, but um, a lot of us are. I'm focused on Illinois, uh, but we're all American citizens. We're all, uh, you all are accounting professionals. I mean, do you look at, and this is, a, I guess, a rhetorical question, unless somebody would like to answer it. Do you look at what Illinois is doing, what's happening at the local level, and say, we did our job? This is the best we could do. We try to demand the kind of uh, adherence to standards that provides as much transparency as possible, as much information as possible, that incentivizes uh, responsible fiscal management of public sector enterprises as possible. Do you feel like Illinois is um, something you'd like to record as uh, a success story? Well, I'll, I'll brief, so, briefly respond, but um, I think we would argue that the information is there, um, whether those that uh, use the financial statements choose to pay attention or not or, uh, is another, another matter. But the information about the liabilities and whatnot, and I think that this board over the years has, has tried hard to add all those liabilities that I think you're concerned about on there to include pensions on, on the balance sheet, I, I will say the statement that position, the, the uh, pensions, the uh, retiree health care, now leases coming. So there's been quite a bit of effort done. Well, I think, uh, well then important. when Marty Ives said he doesn't understand the distinction between the fiscal accountability and operational accountability that's made, and in fact, he, I shouldn't say he doesn't understand it, he feels it's bull jive. Um, what is he talking about? Well, I, I was, didn't serve with, with Marty. I can <laughs> guess. You want to take a stab at that one day? I, 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 I mean, Ask Marty. I, I, my, I, I raise it because there's obviously a difference of opinion, including uh, among people who know a lot more about this than I do. Oh, absolutely. Definitely true there. Chris. So, um, one, thank you for coming out and providing um, a, a, a perspective of a, of a citizen. Um, who seems to be very passionate about this topic. So we appreciate that. Uh, but I wanted to focus on your example that you provided. And so you, provide this you provided this example of the checking account and the, the, the longer term expenses, whether they be a car note or credit card payments, et cetera. And um, you know, one thing that we focused on is that our financial statements will reflect both that short term view which is your checking account maybe after you paid for your Netflix and your, your cable bill, et cetera, with your $1,000 left over, as well as that long-term mortgage balance and credit card note, et cetera. Um, and with those two, 
you can then decide on that with that thousand dollars how you're going to go about uh, paying off those long-term debts but you really need both of them in order to do that so you need the shorter term perspective to influence and and help you appreciate the longer term perspective without one then you couldn't have another and if you were to take the longer term perspective and you take that thousand dollars that you have at the end of your month uh, the month of your account and you apply uh, your credit card balance and all of those other things to it well then now you just have a negative balance of four hundred thousand dollars or whatever it is and and that really doesn't and so taking everything away and just having that really won't help you make an informed decision. So I think the question that we, we need to ask is, do the individuals responsible for making the decisions have the tools to make the decisions? You quoted um, liabilities, uh, unfunded pensions, percentages. That's all, th that information comes from the financial statements. I understand. That, so, so everything that you're quoting in, in the information that you have that it's informed your testimony um, and you had a great testimony but everything that you you've uh, that, that you've used to inform your testimony is actually from the financial statements so we have to understand that the financial statements are providing that information but they're providing multiple perspectives so that um, the parties responsible for making those tough decisions like where that thousand dollars is going to go at the end of the month like we have to with car notes and and, and, and minimum payments on, on credit card bills, et cetera, that they can make the right decisions and not spend that money um, at a nightclub. But that's not, how it's, uh, that's not how it's working in operation, right? I mean, that's how, what you're describing, continuing my tortured metaphor of sort of the household budget, is um, not at all what's happening. What's happening is they're saying, uh, number one, if I get a, a payday loan, I count that as revenue for my short-term outlook. Number two, if I, um, if I put my uh, Netflix payment, if I put my car note on a credit card, then I don't have to include that in my monthly budget. So it allows me to live beyond my means until I can't. And so that's actually what's happened in practice with units of government is the short-term perspective and the gimmicks associated with painting that short-term picture that have been used uh, have allowed government to live beyond its means at every level and in spectacular fashion. And I would just say, because um, we can go back and forth with the analogy, but if you were to pay your car note on your credit card, then your credit card would reflect that balance. So again, it goes back to the, the whole, which is looking at both parts of the financial statements in order to inform your decisions. So I understand what you're saying. If we want to look at one piece of the financial statements and if, if someone would argue that the funds are flawed because there's certain information that is not reflected in the fun, funds, that's very fair. But the point here is to say that the funds should be viewed in, in conjunction with those government-wide financial statements and the footnotes all together in order to give somebody a complete perspective. Yeah, no, I appreciate that. And I, pre I mean, I, I get the sort of gestalt argument you're making about uh, all of the financial disclosures. Uh, I'm, and, and, and by the way, that this is not just the only, this is not the only sort of accounting gimmick as I've referenced a couple times, uh, you know, the, the politicians use uh, when you count debt as revenue, that's another gimmick. And as you say, that should be reflected. And, Sometimes it's miscast and so forth. But I, I just think that any advance to t tighten up the picture uh, to uh, operate, by the way, as the General Assembly attempted to do back in the mid-90s, and even Steve Rauschenberger didn't appreciate at the time that a wording change allowed for sort of uh, a loophole in what uh, he and other legislators were trying to accomplish with respect to government accounting. Um, that I, I just, I don't really understand what the downside is to presenting a fuller picture uh, in a more uh, succinct way uh, so that, again, there's less opportunity for the fun with numbers that political leaders and, and policymakers have. That's all. David. Again, we, we appreciate everything you're saying because there's a lot of different views and we've, we've heard a lot of different views during our, our due process. Um, 
You mentioned the, the loophole in the legislation because one of the things I originally am from Illinois, born and raised in Illinois, um, and you know when when I hear the the comment made about Illinois has gap-based budgeting, but yet I look at the Illinois financial statements and look at the general fund information, and I see a 16 billion dollar deficit. Obviously, it's clear that it's not a gap-based budget. Otherwise, you wouldn't have a $16 billion deficit. In your opinion, how did that occur if they have a <laughs> gap-based budget and they're supposed to be following you know, our, our standards as flawed as, as people may think they are, but yet they still have a $16 well, billion dollar deficit? Well, right. I mean, you, know, you can put up red lights and people can blow through them. Um, yeah. So um, we can have a balanced budget provision in the state constitution as we do, um, and it can be a punchline according to those in power passing budgets. And this is the whole point. If everybody agrees, then it's balanced, then it's balanced. Well, no. I mean, people can come together and do wonderful things, or people can come together and work collaboratively to rob a bank. Right? Yeah. Co collaboration isn't the idea. The truth or righteousness is the idea. And what you have in Springfield is both parties coming together over an extended period of time to ignore uh, standards, whether they be uh, gap standards, whether they be constitutional requirements. There's just sort of, um, uh, you know, we make it up as we go along when we use the Constitution when it's convenient. We discard it when it isn't. We use accounting principles when they're convenient. We discard them when they aren't. I mean, that's just sort of a, obviously a political statement that's beyond your scope. I get it, but that's sort of my point. I mean, this is, I don't expect this body to be able to wave a magic wand and correct all of the ills that Illinois has imposed on itself at the state and local level. But the point is that anybody that has the authority and the standing and the respect to say, if this is promoted, if this is uh, the outgrowth of something that a particular body has produced, then that's something that we have to take seriously. Anything that requires policy leaders, politicians, policymakers to um, have to hew a standard of conduct, of professionalism, of integrity, and has the additional benefit of better informing the public as to what the reality on the ground is, so they can be more informed about the debates that are happening or be more activist in promoting the debates that should be happening, is a positive development. And there have been few positive developments along those lines f for some time. Thank you very much. Unfortunately, we're at the end of our time. Um, thank you. Dan, thank you so much for taking the time to <laughs> share your thoughts and respond to board thank comments you. and questions. Appreciate, Appreciate it. it. Thank you.